Welcome back, guys. We are going to continue reading The Wild Robot, the first story by Peter Brown. We are on chapter 16, The Pine Tree. Roz was in no hurry to leave the tree. She stayed on her branch long after the bears had gone, enjoying some peace and looking herself over. In addition to bite marks and claw marks, the robot was also covered in dirt, which of course meant it was time for another cleaning. She was making good progress when she felt something sticky on her arm. The problem with sitting in a pine tree is that eventually the tree's sticky resin will find you. It always does, and it found Roz. The robot scrubbed and scraped at the resin, and soon her fingers were completely coated in the sticky stuff. Then it was all over her arms and her legs and her torso, and then things were about to get even messier. A robin swooped into the tree and began screeching and fluttering around Roz. The bird had recently finished building herself a new nest, it was a little work of art, a delicate basket woven from grass and twigs and feathers, and it was right above the robot's head. Screech! Screech! said the robin. I do not understand you, robin, said the robot. The robot continued screeching and fluttering, and then splat! She splattered her droppings across the robot's face. This bird was serious. So Roz scooted away, farther out of the branch, until she heard a quick, sharp crack. Before Roz knew what was happening, the tree branch snapped under her weight and she went crashing to the forest floor. She hit the ground hard and lay there as broken branches and pine cones and needles showered down on top of her. There was another splat, and then the quiet returned to the forest. The camouflaged insect. Roz was a mess. She lay under the tree covered in a heap of broken branches and pine cones and needles. She still hadn't removed the sticky resin from her body. And then there were the bird droppings. She was about to get up and go give herself a rigorous cleaning when she noticed a peculiar twig. The twig was moving. It was crawling along one of the broken branches on the ground. With a gentle touch, the robot picked up the twig. Hello, stick insect. My name is Roz. You are very well camouflaged. The stick insect's body was long and thin. He had the same shape and colors and markings as a real twig. If you looked closely, though, you might see two tiny eyes and two spindly antennae. The insect did not make a sound. He sat perfectly still. As still as the robot, the two of them sat still and silently stared at each other for a while. Thank you, stick insect, said Roz as she placed him back where she found him. You have taught me an important lesson. I can see how camouflage helped you to survive. Perhaps it could also help me to survive. Chapter 18. This is one of my favorite pictures in the book. The Camouflaged Robot. I'll show you in a second. As you know, reader, Roz had always liked to keep herself as clean as possible. But her desire to stay alive was stronger than her desire to stay clean. And our robot decided it was time she got dirty. Roz was going to camouflage herself. She'd gotten the idea from the stick insect, but Roz quickly realized that camouflaging herself as a twig was out of the question. No, the robot would have to blend into the landscape itself. She began by smearing handfuls of thick mud over her entire body. Then she plucked ferns and grasses from the ground and sank their roots into their new muddy, muddy coating. She placed colorful flowers around her face to disguise her glowing eyes. And any bare patches were covered with tree leaves and strips of moss. Our robot now looked like a great tuft of plants walking through the forest. She waited for darkness and then she padded to the center of a clearing. 
nestled herself between some rocks and became part of the landscape. A few hours later, the sky was brightening, the fog was lifting, the nighttime animals were slinking home, and the daytime animals were beginning to stir. It was just an ordinary morning on the island. This is the picture. I just think it's so cool. You can see Raza's two glowing eyes there, if you look close enough. However, there was that new tuft of plants in that one forest clearing. Only the bees had noticed the tuft. They buzzed around it, completely unaware that the robot was hidden beneath. And so Ross sat there, right in the open yet completely unseen, and observed the wilderness around her. She watched flowers slowly turn toward the sun. She listened to rodents crawl through the reeds. She smelled the moist, piney air. She felt worms wiggle against her muddy sides. A week later, the tuft of plants was gone, but there was a new clump of seaweed on the shore. A week, of, a week after that, the clump of seaweed was gone, but there was a new bramble on the mountain. And there was a new log in the riverbank. And then a new rock in the forest. Chapter 19, The Observations Clouds scudded through the sky. Spiders spun intricate webs. Berries beckoned to hungry mouths. Fox stalked hares. Mushrooms rose up from the leaf litter. Turtles plopped into ponds. Moss spread across tree roots. Vultures hunched over carcasses. Ocean waves beat against the coastline. Tadpoles became frogs. Caterpillars became butterflies. The camouflaged robot observed it all. Chapter 20, The Language of the Animals It started with the birds. They had always been skittish when the robot was near. They would stare and screech, then scatter. But now that Roz was camouflaged, she could secretly observe their normal behavior, right up close. Roz noticed chickadees fluttering through the same flowers and singing the same song every morning. She noticed a lark who swooped down to the same rock and sang the same song every afternoon. She noticed the same two magpies singing to each other from across the same meadow every morning. After weeks of robotically studying the birds, Roz knew what each bird would sing, and when they would sing, and eventually why they would sing. The robot was beginning to understand the birds, but she was also beginning to understand the porcupines and the salamanders and the beetles. She discovered that all the different animals shared one common language, and they just spoke in the language in different ways. You might say each species spoke with its own unique accent. When Roz first listened to the chickadees, their song sounded like Tweedle, Tweedle. But now when the chickadees sang, Roz heard, Oh, what a lovely day it is! Oh, what a lovely day it is! Oh, here's the picture of the chickadee. Very cute. Deer spoke mostly with their bodies. By simply turning her head, a doe could say to her family, Let's look for clovers by the stream. Snakes often hissed to themselves things like, I know there's a tasty mouse around here somewhere. Bees said very little. They used their wings to buzz a few simple words like nectar and sun and hive. Frogs spent much of their time searching for each other. One would croak, where are you? I can't see you. And then another would reply, I'm over here. Follow my voice. When Roz first stomped across the island, the animal squawks and growls and chirps had sounded nothing more than meaningless noises. But she no longer heard animal noises. Now she heard animal words. Ooh, so she's starting to understand 
we're going to go ahead and stop there today because the next chapter is a little longer and it's kind of like a new part of the beginning of this story. So we'll stop there today. I hope you enjoyed it. I hope you join me again tomorrow for another couple of chapters of The Wild Robot. I am enjoying you um, spending your, your summer time, just a couple of minutes a day, uh, reviewing this book with me. So I hope that you are having a fun day. I hope that you are safe. And I hope that you have a great day. And hopefully I'll see you tomorrow. Bye.